awesome to have you. We're glad if you've been here for 25 years, we're glad you're here too. Okay, and we're right in the middle of a series called Wild Goose Chase. And what we've been doing with this series is the reason why we're doing this, because you know, in the world's vantage point, a wild goose chase is a, I mean, you're, you're getting nowhere trying to find something that doesn't exist. Really why we're doing this series is because the Celtic Christians had a name for the Holy Spirit. And they would call the Holy Spirit on God gloss. And that meant wild goose. Uh, because it really represented the mystery of the Holy Spirit, the unpredictability of the Holy Spirit, the adventure, uh, just, just the, everything about the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so they were on a pursuit of trying to know and have a, a better understanding and a better relationship with the Holy Spirit. So, you know, if you missed last week or the week before, you can go to our website. Also, highly recommend you go through our discussion questions. Uh, if you lost yours when you leave here Sunday, and you know, we try to go over these in our small groups, and it really helps to talk about these questions and talk about these decisions that we're making. Uh, it's really helped me to get open and talk with people about uh, what we're talking about. Uh, three weeks ago, we talked about anybody remember who we talked about? Nehemiah. A little slow on that one, a little slow on that one. I want to encourage you guys. Once again, go back and you can hear it again. It, it's really, really uh, important. And then last week, anybody know who we talked about last week? Yeah, we talked about Holy Spirit. Talking about that Moses, okay? And we talked about the cage of responsibility and the cage of routine. And so, really, guys, I, this is so important because what we're trying to do, God's trying to call us into an adventure. And I feel like some of you, you really, really need an adventure. It's written all over your face this Sunday morning. Okay, you need an adventure. Uh, you're, you're stuck in a rut, and you know it, and, and God's trying to say, come on, come on. Okay, because here's what we're talking about in this adventure. What we're talking about is if you go on a goose chase of the Holy Spirit, you don't know where, you don't know who, you don't know when, how God is going to work in your life, and it brings sheer excitement. We serve a good God who wants to take us from here to here in our lives. So today, uh, we're going to be looking at Abraham, and we're going to be talking uh, about a different cage today, okay? And today, I want to start out with a story, because it really typifies, you know, what this story is all about and how we change as we get older. My son, when he was six years old, we lived in Boynton Beach, Florida. And uh, we oftentimes would go on mission trips uh, to, to visit uh, people or do different work in the ministry. So we would leave babysitters in charge of our kids, people that were close to us, families. And so on one occasion, Nick went with a babysitter or a person to spend time. It was a Saturday morning, and they went off in the car. And just let me say, we're good parents, okay? We're good parents. But when he came back from the time, uh, our six-year-old son you know, there's supposed to be another babysitter there waiting because we had everything mapped out, time perfectly. We're good parents. Okay, let me emphasize, we're good parents. But the babysitter wasn't there when he got dropped off. And the person who dropped him off had to go. So we had a six-year-old boy, our son, home alone. And he was nervous. So he's in the house, he goes in the house, he's alone. And he gets on his knees at his bed, in his bedroom, and he prays to God. He says, God, please bring the babysitter right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Ding dong. The doorbell rings immediately. And he comes home, you know, when, when mom and dad get home, he, he tells us, Mom, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I prayed today. Because the babysitter wasn't here when I was here and I was home alone. And, you know, we're kind of, what? <laughs> but I prayed to God. And when I prayed, God answered my prayer immediately. And what do we say as parents? Thank you, God. Thank you for... But you know what? There's a part of us as adults that we hear that story and we go... 
Maybe the babysitter was just running a couple minutes late. But it, 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 it really exemplifies a childlike faith. See, because Nick really believed that God heard and answered his prayer immediately. You see, for a child, you cannot put limits on his or her faith. There's no limit. You know, the only thing that limits a child's faith is what they can imagine. And let me tell you, a child's imagination runs wild. But you know, when we heard that story, we're like, "Ah, amen, God, thank you. But I got to confess, I'm not sure my faith was where Nick's faith was. And here's the challenge. When we get older, we get as, become adults, guess what happens to our faith? We make assumptions. Well, the reason why the babysitter didn't show up was because of traffic or this, but it really wasn't the prayer. And so today we're going to talk about the cage of assumptions, and I've got a victim today, and, and someone told me, we, we need a woman to be in the cage. Okay, so by popular demand, we have Leslie Shirelicki. She is in the cage, the cage of assumption. Poor woman. See, I'm so glad you guys aren't cheering for her. You don't want to be in the cage. She has no idea she's in the cage. She's going about her business. She's doing her deal, but she is clearly in the cage of assumptions. What assumptions say is basically... This is how God is and works. Our surroundings, what people say about God, what people say about reality, is what we assume. And we no longer believe that God can do great things. We measure God. We limit God. See, what happens is is when we get in the cage of assumptions is we lose the spirit in our spiritual adventure. We no longer wait for God to do something. We go, oh, probably not. He's probably not going to work in this situation in my life for one reason or another. And it's extremely sad what happens. You know, and here's the thing. The older you get, the more assumptions we make about what God can do. So today, we're going to learn from, from Abraham, and it's a beautiful example of how God can set you free from your cage of assumptions. And so we're going to pick it up in in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. There we go. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. So in this situation, this was like the second time that God showed up and he's giving Abram at this point he hadn't quite got the name Abraham but he's giving Abram and if we could fix the uh the the frame of the the screen that would be great but he's he's giving him a promise he's saying I'm with you I'm your great shield and your very great reward but there's a problem in Abram's in Abram's life And he goes on and he describes this. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? What's Abram's problem? Along with his wife, Sarah. They're well along in their years, over 75, and no children. And the thing about having no children at that age means you're never going to have children. And not only that, in this time frame, when people didn't have children, it was shameful. And it was a horrible existence. See, because they didn't have adoption and everything, it it wasn't the same. They they weren't your children. He had this guy, uh, Eleazar, but it wasn't his child. And so God goes on and he says this, and Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, out of a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So what's God telling him? 
in your old age, you're going to have a child. And he had a choice to make. And, and, and here's the thing with all of us. We have a choice to make. When we're in a cage of assumptions, and the assumption is, can you have children in an old age? 90 plus years old as a man, 80 plus years old as a woman, can you physically have children at that age? The reality is it's an impossibility. Physical impossibility for a woman at that age to have children. There's a human element to this. I already mentioned some of it, but how do you think Abram and Sarah felt every time a friend or a family member or a servant brought a child into the setting? There was a birthday party of a small child or maybe a baby shower. I'm not sure if they had baby showers at that time, but they had, they had gatherings. What was that like to hear a, a, a child laugh, a little child laugh? Seeing little children, as we do every Sunday, running around. What do you think they felt on a daily basis? Pain. And in this culture, you felt cursed by God. And that's how people would look at you. That there's something wrong with you. There's a curse on you. And it had spiritual ramifications. So they walked around. And could you imagine how many times they cried together at bedside? We have no children. And I bet you they also fought about it too. As married couples, we fight. But they fought about whose fault is it? It's your fault. You're the reason. No, it's your fault. You can't give me children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you just think, man, and here's the thing with this, this human element: the older they got didn't mean that it would get better. In fact, the older they became the worse, the deeper the pain. And this was it. And see, sometimes when we read the Scriptures and we read stories in the Bible, we don't really identify with these people because we already know, oh yeah, I know how it's going to turn out. You don't identify with the moment and the reality. And this went on for about 25 years. But God does something. One day, God does something. He took him outside and said, The Lord took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So what's the whole point? What's God trying to do here with Abram? He tells him, look up. Why does he tell him to look up? Because we spend so much time looking around, don't we? And why look up? See, because all of us have an existence. We live in a manufactured reality. Abraham lived, Abram lived in an eight-foot ceiling tent. I'm not sure if it was eight foot, but more or less eight foot. So when he looked up, what did he see? The roof of his tent. When you look up, what do you see? You see a ceiling. And what ceilings do is they limit, they put a limit, they put a ceiling on God's promises. So it said, I'm going to take you on a field trip, and let's go outside. How many of you have ever been to a, an outside place where there's no light pollution, in the middle of nowhere, and it's super, super clear, and you can see all the stars and, and not only that, you can, see, you can see the band. I mean, I can remember nights where I saw the band of the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. You see a cloud in the galaxy. I mean, it's thick. And there's so many stars in those bands of stars. And you can't count. I mean, could you imagine Abram out there that night? He said, one, two, three. Oh, wait a minute. One, two. You can't. And there's some nights where the sky is like it's on top of you. And God's trying to say, listen, you can't count. I'm about to do something for you you can't even imagine. 
And this one day, in one day, 25 years, one day, God says, things are going to be different from now forward. And he had a choice to make. And here's what he did. And here's what happens. When we look up, looking up recalibrates, recalibrates your perspective on how big God is and how small we are. Have you ever really felt small when you go outside and see God's creation? You know, you and I need a recalibration, often. And when you go out stargazing and you, you see, you, 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 it's like there's no limit. How far away are these stars that we're looking at? But by not going outside, out of sight, out of mind, and guess what? Out of reach. God's promises, when we live in our manufactured reality, God's promises are out of reach. They're not real anymore. And that's why God had to take him out. And God wants to take you out of your cage of assumptions because your assumptions are, this is how I live and this is the way it is and everybody agrees and God can't do this and God can't do that. This is normal. This is your normal. And so God is calling us out to see how big he is. And this is what's awesome about Abram. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He believed. He made the right choice. You have a choice today. You have a choice every day. What are you going to do? You're going to live in your world of assumptions and put limits on what God can do, or are you going to make a choice? I'm going to trust in God's promises. I don't see it. I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust his promises. And through believing, we can leave our cage of assumptions. And we can become children again. Here's what A.W. Tozer said. He says, a low view of God is the cause of a hundred less evils. But a high view of God is the solution to 10,000 temporal problems. Which, which side of this equation would you like to live on? Having solutions to your problems, 10,000 of them on a daily basis, or getting caught up in the minutia of 100 lesser evils? Basically caging your life, keeping you inside a cell. And here's how we cage God. Here's how we get in the cage and we end up in a cage. We reduce God to the size of our problems, fears, mind limits, and worse sins. These four things. See, we take God. See, here it's God is capitalized. We take the capital G and we make it a little g. And we take our problems and the little p becomes a big P. And because God is small, our problems get big or our fears. It's a capital F and a little God. And our mind limits what we can imagine. Some of us can't even imagine God doing these things. And then the, the, the last one is our worst sins. We don't believe God could forgive us of our worst sins. There's a limit, there's a ceiling, there's a roof on what God can forgive. And you live in that cage. And you know what? The interesting thing about this, this is a form of idolatry. A terrible evil. That we let these problems, we let our fears, they become gods to us. That control us, that dictate what God does in our life. And this is really serious. So I want to ask you to do an evaluation. I, now I hope you can take, because here's the deal. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to follow the Christian faith, do you think it's right for us to make God small? I mean, it's offensive to some people to put a little G in front of God, but in the way you live, that's what you're doing. 
when you let your problems in your marriage, in your family, in your career, in your morality, in your fears, if you let those things control you. And as us for as a church, if we let our limits control us, instead of let's go on a field trip. God says, Come on, I want to take you outside. I want to show you something. I want to show you who I am. I know who you are. You know who you are. You know what your your assumptions are. I want to take you outside. Look at this example, Matthew 13, verse 57. I apologize for the problems, but you get get the most of it. And this this was an example of Jesus in his hometown. He went back to his hometown, and he's preaching, and he's teaching, and he's, and all of his neighbors are there, and they said, hey, aren't you Jesus, son of Joseph? Aren't your, aren't your brothers here? Aren't your sisters here? Yeah, we know you. You're the carpenter's son, and you did carpentry work. You did carpentry work at my house, and it says here that they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his, own, in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Their assumptions about Jesus. Now, I don't think it's good for Leslie to stay in this. She's not going to see any miracles. Leslie, do you want out of this cage of assumptions? Come on out of there. And let's see what God can do. So let's let her out. Come on, give, give, her, give her some encouragement. Come on out of this. See, this is so sad, though. Their lack of faith put a limit on God. See, because we assume God can't do this. They assume because it was Jesus who they grew up with, son of Joseph. And here's what happens in church world when you've been in church a long time. We do the same thing. We make assumptions about God and about church. You can't do that. I've never seen it. It's not possible. This is how you do Christianity. This is how we do church. And he couldn't do miracles. Why don't we see more miracles? We see a few, but why aren't there more? Why isn't God just just working powerfully among us in our world today, in our lives today? I'll tell you why. It's because we got too many assumptions. We're letting the media, we're letting people around us What they say about God, what they say about the Bible, what they say and they say, here is God. And they question his existence and we start to question what he can do. We wouldn't question God and his existence because we're firm in that. But we question what God could do. We question the changes that can be made. And we develop our own manufactured ceiling about who God is and what he can do. And it's sad. Do you think Jesus invited us to this? Do you think he's inviting you to this? I'm saying no. And here's the deal, spiritual growth. If you want to grow spiritually, it's not about knowing more. Well, I want to know more. I want to take some classes, and I want you to do more teaching on the Bible. It's not just about knowing more, because you can know a lot. Spiritual growth or spiritual progress is not about knowing, but when our knowledge becomes conviction, and that conviction dictates how we live. Basically, God would rather have a hundred people with deep convictions that change the way they live versus a thousand people who know a lot. Some of you know a lot. You've learned a lot over the years. But the way you live doesn't show any conviction. Because things aren't changing. There's no evidence of God working powerfully. And guess what? 
I'll be the first to tell you I'm probably the most guilty person in the room because I'm your spiritual minister leader. And what I'm telling you today is let's raise the roof on what God can do. I confess it to you. We got to do it. But listen, I'm not going to carry this by myself. Okay, I'm calling me out. I'm calling you out. Stop limiting God and what he can do in your marriage and in your family. Stop making excuses. Stop making things complicated. And start raising the roof on what God can do. And let's really grow spiritually. Look at what Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Here in the Lighthouse Church of Christ, light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. That's here in the Lighthouse Church of Christ. For you to get from here to the sun, traveling at 65 miles per hour, do you know how long it would take you? See, this is, the, this is the world that we operate. We travel about 65 miles per hour. Do you know how long it would take you to travel to the, to the sun at that speed? It would take you 163 years to travel to the sun. And no pit stops. No bathroom breaks. I'm talking 24-7, 365 days a year for 163 years. That's how long it would take you to get to here to the sun. But when you walk outside today and you stand in the sun and you feel the warmth of that sun on your face, do you know how long it took that sun warmth to travel from the sun to the earth? Eight minutes. Eight minutes to warm your face. Do you know what the nearest galaxy is to our sun? 24,000 light years. This is the most recent information. Here's, here's the names of them. Canis Major Dwarf. It's a smaller galaxy. 25,000 light years to get to that galaxy. In miles, you'd have to multiply 25,000 light years. You'd have to multiply that times 5.8 billion to get the number in miles. It's up in the sextillion. That number is incomprehensible. I did a calculator. It doesn't even come out. It comes with X's and E's and stuff like that. It's a huge number. It's incomprehensible. So many zeros. You can't get that number. It's huge. We can't wrap our mind around that number. Let me tell you something. For all of us in this room, even for some of you who are online, all of you, on your best day, your best thought is 24,000 light years apart from God's weakest, worst day. That's how much distance is between his thoughts and our thoughts. You think there's a little room for us to grow? See, when I hear this stuff, I just go, oh, I can't. When they start talking about the universe and how big it is and how many stars and how many galaxies, and you just go, oh, I, it makes my head hurt. It's so big. That's on purpose. You, you can't get God. Look at some of these verses. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. Where is the limit on this? There's no limit. What business do we have limiting God? Ephesians 4, 3, 20. We love this verse. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. What can you ask or imagine? God can do way more than that according to his power that works in us. And then in Romans 8.31, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is what's against you. 
Your manufactured eight-foot ceiling is what's keeping you from changing, from growing, from thriving. And I want to invite you tonight just, or today to, 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 to start letting God show you like he did Abraham. Come on outside. Let's go for a walk. Let me show you. And asking God, God, raise the roof on my faith in whatever specific area it is. And this is the thing. Paul talked about Abraham in this way. He says, against all hope, Abram in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the facts. Or face the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Let me tell you something. Faith is illogical. It's not logical. Faith is not logical. But it's not illogical. Faith is theological. Meaning this. You have your reason and your logic, but you include God in the mix. Theology is the study of understanding God. So if you want to understand God and His size and His ability to work in your life and in situations, you always have to include Him in the mix. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you include God, it raises the roof to your situation. But when you don't include God, what happens? You're only left with these facts. I'm 100, and my wife's womb is dead. Nothing's going to happen here. Nothing is going to change. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. He kept God in the mix. He kept God included in his world. In fact, he said, God is greater than my world. Amen. When we start to live that God is greater than our problems, that God is greater than our, our fears, our mind limits, and even our worst sins, incredible things start to happen changes most of us are a result of those things that God has done but it's only happened a few times why not take it higher why not more unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God but faith puts God between us and our circumstances how do you want to live? You want your circumstances to dictate the outcome of your life? Or would you rather have God come between you and your circumstances? So that when God is in the middle, anything is possible. There's an unpredictability. There's a, there's a, there's a possibility always that things can get better, things could change, things can, can be through the roof. This is huge. And I say far too many of us are letting our circumstances come between us and God versus God coming become between us and our circumstances. Today could be your day to decide no more. I'm going to put God, I'm going to be a theologian. And a theologian isn't meaning having a big head and being book smart. A theologian means I'm going to understand God and how he works in my life. And his power and his ability to change us. So here's the practical questions. What eight-foot ceilings have you put on God? And I want you to fill in the blank this week. I want you to answer the question. What ceilings, what eight-foot ceilings have you put on God? And you need to decide what are they specifically and talk about it with each other. If you're a guest here today, what are your, what are your barriers with church? What are your barriers with God? What are your barriers with the Bible? Go ahead and say it. Get it out there, and you make a choice. Are you going to deal with that ceiling or not? What assumptions have you have kept you caged? 
What assumptions have kept you in this cage? And then lastly, what promises have you given up on? No, it's not going to happen in my life. Maybe Abraham, maybe Moses, but not in my life. Whenever you do that, you've just put yourself in a cage. Here's two assumptions that we're going to talk about, and then we're going to wrap it up. Number one is, these are very common assumptions, and this was Abraham's assumption, or the struggle. He didn't take it. It was the struggle. Maybe Sarah's assumption. I'm too old. I'm too old. See, because you reach a point in your life where you go, well, you know, I'm, I'm beyond. That's for somebody younger than me. That applies to them, not me. See, I've got health problems. I've got limitations. My body doesn't work the way it used to. I don't think, I don't think God, it's been too long. Or you could reverse it. Instead of I'm too old, I'm too young. Let me flip the equation. Some of you think you're too young for God to work. I mean, for the older people in the crowd, you've got, you've got Moses. When did he start his, his wild goose chase? 80 years old. Abraham, when did he start his wild goose chase? 75 years old. You know, you've got so many examples. Caleb, how old was he when he started his wild goose chase? Conquering the hills of the promised land. 85 years old. I'm still as strong as I used to be when I was a young man, was his quote. I still got it. What was it for Caleb? God can work through me. You know, I appreciate our brother Marv. He's 72 years old, right? 72? Now, does a 72-year-old have any business running in triathlons? has no business running in triathlons. He does it anyway. And he gets medallions. You know why he wins most of the medallions? Because there are very few 72-year-olds running in those races. Isn't that right? But I just appreciate that spirit because he's saying, I'm not going to accept my surroundings or my ceilings, what everybody's telling me, or even what our bodies are telling us. I can't. No, I can, and I will. That's the kind of spirit we need to develop spiritually. Okay, Let, let's talk about young people. How old was Joseph when he started his wild goose chase? Any idea? Any? 17 years old. When David killed Goliath, any idea how old he was? Teenager. He's young, ruddy, handsome boy. That's what Goliath called him. He says, what's this boy doing out here trying to fight me? And I don't want to leave, leave the women out. What about Mary? How old was she when she gave birth to the Son of God? Any idea? 14 years old. Are you too young to go on a wild goose chase? Absolutely not. Here's another one. It's never been done that way before. And I, I confess, guys, spiritually speaking, as a church, we've put a lot of ceilings on what God can and can't do. We've never done it that way before. And I'm saying, so what? So what? Why not? Why not try something new? Responsibly, biblically. But why not? Let's see what God can do. Let's be open to the Holy Spirit and what he's going to say. Let's look into the scriptures deeper. Let's understand. I want to tell you a story about a guy. His name is uh, Dick uh, Fanberry. And he was a high jump jumper in the 1968 Olympics. Up to his time, early 60s, middle 60s, there was a certain style of how you do the high jump in the Olympics. You would go face forward over the bar. But Dan wanted to try something different. And so he experimented with this new technique of going the reverse and going backwards over the bar. His coach told him, you need to stop doing that. If you're going to really compete for gold and you're really going to do something, you need to stop doing that. But Dan, uh, Dick would not be moved from what he believed 
was the best way for him to do it. So I want you, we've reached into the Olympic archives, 1968 video archives. Let's watch this example of it's never been done this way. The 1968 Olympic Games proved to be a turning point in the history of the high jump event. Into the Mexico City Olympic Arena came not only a new name to the sport, but a new approach, which was to revolutionize the high jump event. Dick Fosbury from the United States demonstrated a new style of high jump, which some considered strange and awkward. It was a jump he had devised in the previous years, and one which unsettled his opponents. While the crowd at first saw him as a novelty, his continued success at clearing the ever-increasing height soon made it apparent he was a serious contender. Valentin Gavrilov from the Soviet Union failed at his attempt of 2.22 meters, while Fosbury and his US teammate Edward Carruthers cleared their way to a jump off. The bar sat at 2.24. Carruthers failed and Fosbury took his new style of high jump over the bar and into the history books. Fosbury had won his gold. Within a few years, the Fosbury flop had become the standard method of jumping in this great Olympic sport. Okay, so Dick basically raised the bar by a foot over time. Not just him, but his method, his style. How high do you want to go? How high do we want to go? And it might be different than the way you've been doing it and we've been doing it. And so I, want us to, I don't want us to live by these assumptions that it's always been done this way. Nobody does it. Let's look at Amazon. Amazon said, you don't need a bookstore to sell books. You can do it online. Boom. Wikipedia says you don't need books. You don't need a book. You don't need somebody to go door to door selling you encyclopedias for some of you who remember that. You don't need books. It can be done online. And people together can contribute and cross reference. I mean, there's so many examples, you know, of people that rose the roof. Why did Jesus, why did Jesus have so many problems with the Pharisees? You know why the Pharisees gave Jesus such a hard time? Because Jesus never did it the way it's always been done. He always changed things. He was a crusader, and they hated it. He was younger than he should have been. He didn't come through their school of study the way he did. He did things unorthodox. He would heal on the Sabbath, and they said, you don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. Who do you think you are? And they wanted to kill him, and finally it succeeded. So what I'm saying today is, spiritually, we have to be careful that we don't live in a cage of assumptions and tell God, this is all you can do. Because it's a sin. It limits us. It limits our, our ability to see his glory. So we have to make a choice, all of us. So let's wrap it up. Genesis 21, verse 1 and 2. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son, Abraham, in his old age. At the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave the name Isaac, the son of Sarah, bore to him. When, he, when his son, Isaac, was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah called, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. You know what Isaac means in Hebrew? Laughter. He laughs. You know what the story really means is? I couldn't laugh. I couldn't jump for joy. Life was limited for me. I put limits. And now I can laugh and people can laugh with me. Not only can I laugh, I can jump for joy. I can smile real big because God has taken what couldn't to be could. Now, this one story, not all stories turn out this way. Okay? Just so you know. And not all stories happen within the time frame that we want. 
But I'm saying the vast majority of the time, God can and will work for us. And we need to run after that. We need to chase that, that goose. We need to go, and God, just like, don't you love, don't you love to hear little children when they're laughing? Don't you love that? They go viral on YouTube, you know? They get these little children that are laughing, giggling, you know, just, just losing their breath. They're laughing so hard. Don't you love that? God loves to hear you laugh. When's the last time you really laughed? When's the last time you really sang a song of joy? Today could be your day. If you'll stop living these assumptions and start living for God. So let me pray for you. I, I hope that uh, you'll be back here next week so we can go through these together. But let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to raise a roof. Let me encourage you, if you're a guest here today, to study the Bible with the person that invited you. And remember, wherever you are spiritually, I bet you there's somebody behind you 10 steps and you can help them and bring them forward. Let's pray together and then you'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for the great example of Abram, Abraham, Sarah. Thank you, God, for the way that you used them to break their, them out of their cage of assumptions. I pray for all of us, and I pray for us as a church, both individually and as a group, God, that we can raise the roof on what your Holy Spirit can do for us, with us, in our lives, and in our world. God, I pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, will you guide us? Will you lift our eyes from our eight-foot ceilings manufactured by man, by us, so that we can see the stars? And that we can decide today to trust in your promises more than our circumstances. Forgive us, God, for our idolatry. And give us a new start to put you where you belong. Much greater, much higher than we could ask or imagine. Bless us today. We want to pray, Father, for our world leaders. Help them, God, to lead well. And help them, Father, to open their hands to help this world be different. And I pray that the gospel of Jesus will reach every corner of our planet to know how much you love us. Thank you. We love you. Be with us. Hear us. Help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. You are dismissed.